You're listening to The Valley Current. Hey, Steve, how you been? Hi, Jack. I'm doing good. Thank That's you. Great. That's great. So we're going to talk about safe agreements, and I sent you a couple of items in advance because I think it's an interesting topic and we can blend in some other ideas, including what ChatGPT has to say, because, hey, you can't start a general discussion without consulting with ChatGPT just to see what it has to say about the topic. And sometimes it says some interesting things. You can't always rely on it, but it definitely will start a conversation and I assume you must have some clients that are asking for some tax advice about writing off a safe agreement type of investment that failed because there are a lot of failures that are happening right now as VCs are tightening their capital flow and angels are tightening and everyone is tightening in the face of recessionary risks, right? Right. So it's a big topic and I did a couple of pieces of research in advance, uh, which could be helpful for folks to think about. I could find no reported decision, that is no reported appellate decision in California, no reported uh, federal decision either, uh, either appellate or district court, that talked at all about um, safe notes or safe agreements, because some people confuse them with convertible notes, they're different from convertible notes. And we can talk about some of those differences. There are cases, of course, because convertible notes have been around forever. There are cases where people have had disputes about convertible notes, which are debt instruments that can convert into equity. And that was the traditional way in which bridge financing and early stage financing was done which is if you weren't buying common stock, you were essentially providing a note with an interest carry on it. And with some conversion formula that allowed you to convert the note into equity based upon some triggering event, typically some funding round. That was the way it was done for many, many years, if not decades. And then Y Combinator, which is an incubator, uh, had a group of lawyers, I think there was one in particular that came up with the idea of, well, why do we even have to do a promissory note? That's a debt instrument. Why don't we say this is a, a safe, that is, it's a, 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 an agreement for future equity. And so the safe is an acronym. It's a four letter acronym, which is sort of a, um, satisfactory agreement for future equity. I'm sure it has some other S means something else. I think S means simple. Simple, right? Simple, simple. Of course, people think safe and they think that really means somehow it's safe in the generic sense of the word safe, but that's not what it means. It means a simple agreement, almost like a stock option or some sort of call right that says when you get to the point of a financing, this is gonna convert into the preferred shares that will presumably issue at the financing. And if it doesn't, then there's some formula that deals with how uh, payout will occur if there's a, a sale of the assets or a sale of the business, that sort of thing. So it doesn't have an interest carry. It doesn't necessarily have a term, although it could it typically does have some discount provision. You're getting a discount going into the round because you're taking more risk, but it doesn't have what might be called the horrendous shadow of a bank, which is, hey, a promissory note is like a bank issuing a debt instrument and saying, if you don't pay on time, we can foreclose. And the worst versions of those promissory notes is when they are secured convertible promissory notes because they have security interests over the assets, which means that the debt can be converted into the asset upon a foreclosure. So that's another flavor. And so for many founders who want flexibility, 
They don't want to have to worry about these things. They want to take them and they issue them themselves. They often do it without lawyers. They use forms that are online and readily available. And they don't realize they're technically issuing a security, but their view of life is, hey, you know, these are sophisticated investors, hopefully accredited investors. And these instruments are typically not for a lot of money, though collectively they could be. 5,000, 10,000, and in the aggregate, it might produce $100,000 worth of angel investment. And they don't really worry about it. They just say, there's no date to be calendared. There's no interest payment to be made. I'm gonna wait to see if I can get to a funding round. If I can't, I'll just tell the folks that signed these agreements that, hey, sorry, the business failed. We're gonna have to shut down or some liability event occurred. And I sent you some examples of product liability, a recent product liability case where a jury came back with a $787 million verdict in Ohio based on the wrongful death of an infant who apparently got stuck between the bunk bed of the second bunk bed and the first bunk bed based on an alleged faulty design. The case actually was a default judgment and the damages, there was no opposing party. I think the party who made the bed is in Vietnam. They must be figuring that judgment is never going to get collected in Vietnam. But it's a good example of shocks that can happen to businesses. And then there's really basically the end of the business happens as a result of that shock, any number of shocks. Before I uh, chip in, um, I should remind anybody listening that nothing we say is legal nor tax advice. And if you need such advice, um, you should talk to a professional about your specific situation. Right, we're talking generally and for an educational purpose only. And we're really saying in a big picture, a 30,000 feet in the air kind of view, what is happening in Silicon Valley and to some degree, the rest of the United States is founders want flexibility and they want to have angel investors that accept risk and who aren't going to pester them. What's really scary, Jack, is when um, one of these failed businesses then starts up another um, almost identical business, perhaps even under the same name, without any legal uh, formal termination of the relationship with the previous investors. And uh, how do you do the accounting for that? Right. I've seen seen that happen. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, a founder starts a business these days based on an idea, a domain name, a slide deck, and maybe the beginning of a prototype piece of software, a prototype e-commerce site, some sort of prototype, which is not fleshed out at all. And typically they'll go to friends and family and they'll say, Hey, I mean, sometimes they go to their own credit cards. Uh, Sometimes they have some savings and they'll say, I want to bootstrap this business. I need some help. And look, I'll give you a piece of paper that says you're going to participate. So it's not a handshake deal. So in that sense, it's an improvement. There have been a name and the name on top of the piece of paper. It says safe. Right. And the name says safe. And so that sort of can induce uh, uh, an unwary, but obviously a person that's not reading the text, the heading of a document is not a guarantee that the document is safe. So the accredited investor, which is a special category of investors that can legally invest in high risk ventures, there's certain requirements under the Securities and Exchange Act and the the section which is a special rule that deals with these things. There's a series of rules, but they all define an accredited investor in a way that says you could suffer this risk without a lot of, of, of consequences. Now there's sometimes there are people that say they're accredited investors and they're not, and there's supposed to be some degree of policing and diligence on that. But let's say you have an accredited investor and they sign a document, the question is, well, what type of document should they sign? The more sophisticated investor will probably ask for a convertible note that has some type of interest rate and some type of um, claim against the assets of the business 
if the business goes under? Because your point is, what happens to those remaining assets when the business goes under? If it's a debt instrument, the debt instrument in the pecking order will have some priority above the common shareholders, including the founder, who has typically common shares. So the typical pecking order would be a secured note, like from a bank would come first, then the unsecured notes or debts would come second, sometimes employment obligations come second. Um, sometimes that tax obligations come first. So there's a pecking order and that pecking order can basically sell off assets if there are assets. But the argument of Y Combinator, and I think there's some validity to this is in a high tech startup, uh, you don't really have much in the way of hard assets. Most of the equipment is leased. Most of the software is intangible and not easily sellable. Most of the other rights, unless there are some patents or copyrights or trademarks or domain names that may have independent value, most of it is once the team disperses, it's it's worthless. It can't be put back together again. The team is too critical to keeping it all going. So uh, what, why bother with a pecking order? No one's going to get paid. That's the argument. But your point is, well, would it be fair for that team to walk across the street, taking with them all the passwords and saying, we're just going to start a new business. And all those people that were previously investors, whether debt instruments, safe agreements, or even common stock purchases, they can somehow just be stranded. The law would not look kindly on that because that would look like a successor. And if they're, they are truly a successor and they're doing the same thing with the same assets and the same team, they should have some liability to share. And then the question is at what level? Because technically they were wiped out. So technically the underlying assets are owned by either the debt holders or and or the safe holders. And that becomes an arm wrestle. Because if you don't have the labor, they often can't do anything with those assets anyway. So it's like a big renegotiation, right? Well, Jack, I sometimes get investors as clients and they have some uh, paper from some kind of a defunct ghost of a business. And their question for me is, well, uh, do I get a tax deduction? And unfortunately, um, unless there is um, some documentary evidence of exactly when the business failed? My answer is no, you don't. You have to either uh, donate, gift your now worthless interest, or you have to um, find somebody. Perhaps you have a, a broker who's willing to um, buy it from you for a token $1 amount. And, and some brokers will do that as a Right. There, there yeah. actually are there actually are a few private firms around that will advertise will buy your dogs to to sort of expedite. And you might be saying like, why are they even doing that? They're generating kind of a a customer list of people that might invest in some future investments that they end up promoting. So it's kind of a way to get leads. So let's pretend you're one of these people that are acquiring essentially dead paper to expedite the write-off, to expedite the view that, well, your basis in that purchase was $10,000, $100,000, sometimes even more. Um, you sell it for a dollar, you have a loss, right? That loss is booked. Presumably it's an arm length sale. The company paying you the dollar, maybe they actually hand you a dollar bill. Maybe they give you a check so the IRS could see you actually receive the check or some sort of a dollar. Well, they're kind of getting your name and address and your email address as a lead and who you are and what kinds of things you invest in. That's an asset for them because in the future, they might say, you know, we, we, we revived the company or they might actually have a few investigators that are looking around to seeing if there are assets there that can be pursued. It's like collection lawyers that buy uh, judgments that haven't been collected. They buy them at a steep discount. 
And then they shake the trees to see if they can actually get some money for the judgment. And there are lots of interesting stories like that where even some big time debt is purchased by hedge funds. It was a major case against Argentina that Argentina lost to a major hedge fund that bought a lot of depressed Argentinian bonds at steep discounts and then pursued litigation to collect and won. And ultimately it was a big issue because the Argentine government didn't want to turn over any money, but there was money. And I think some airplane assets or, or aircraft assets that were from Argentina that were frozen, or sometimes there are ships that are locked up by the court as a way to kind of make sure the judgment can be executed. And the federal judge that had that case said, look, it's a legitimate debt and it's got to be paid. And there's an asset here that can pay it. So I'm going to seize the asset and then we're going to auction it off and the debt's going to get paid. And so there's been some great stories of hedge funds that have made a fortune uh, doing this, but it really is a uh, challenging work. And you could say, you know, the reason for the steep discount is it's highly uncertain whether there'll be collection. But for a startup company that mainly was working on software, I mean, I just got one of these in the email from one of the investments that I made. I was surprised I hadn't heard from them for many years. And I think I had signed the safe agreement. I'm pretty sure it was a safe agreement. It wasn't a negotiated uh, convertible note. And, you know, they didn't hold any shareholder meetings that they invited me to because it's a safe agreement. It's not equity. So you don't get invited to a shareholder meeting. They didn't give me any financial reports because, hey, it's not really a, an obligation. You're not a shareholder. You're not a debt holder. You're kind of in this limbo uh, area of purgatory until something happens. And as a result, you don't really have any rights to information unless you negotiate that in the agreement, unless you say I'm entitled to, you know, fill out the, fill out the blank, whatever the company issues to shareholders, whatever the company issues to banks, whatever the company issues to the board of directors to try to put some discipline. But often these companies will reject investors that want discipline because their view of life is look, you have to just accept the risk. This is a high risk deal. And so you have to accept that this could crash and burn. And we don't really want to hear that you're upset about it. So is safe unsafe? It kind of depends on who the team is, who the CEO is, who's on the board of directors, who are the advisors, and how do they feel about their reputations? If the thing crashes and burns maybe too quickly, most people want to believe well, if it lasts for five or so years, they must have given it a good shot. And the case I'm talking about, it actually lasted about seven or eight. And they did have a product and it did come to market. And if you went on the website, and I won't reveal their name, it would look like they're still in business. But the truth is they basically ran out of money and they couldn't get VCs to open up to do a round of financing. So the safe agreements never converted into shares. And that means all the safe holders basically have nothing other than that paperwork, unless they want to test. And so far, as I said, I don't see a case where someone tests whether the safe agreement can result in some sort of accounting of some sort, if there is some asset base that's left over that can be counted. I'm amazed that there have been no cases, no people out there who said, well, it was called safe, and I thought it was safe. And uh, where's my money? Well, um, I, I think this would be a bonanza for lawyers. I didn't check uh, Delaware. It would seem to me that most of this paper issues out of California. That's where Y Combinator is. That's where it started. But it also quickly morphed into Delaware, and most Delaware corporations and most Delaware forms will use safe agreements and most lawyers representing those companies, startup companies, including myself, will recommend to founders uh, safe agreements because they tend to be less onerous and less obligatory. Another example. One quick caution uh, here is that if a company is an S corporation, 
then it has only allowed one class of outstanding stock and a simple agreement for future equity. It's got the word equity in it. It could easily be considered by the IRS a second class of equity, um, causing the S corporation to lose its, to unexpectedly lose its S status, which could be catastrophic for the operation. Right. You, you don't so, see, you don't see that conflict so much only because most startups will start as C corporations in anticipation that BCs will not invest in, in S corps. They, they just won't. They, they want to have multiple classes. They want to have preferred shares. They want to have something that's a traditional model. Uh, they want other benefits that are tied to C corporations. They want stock option plans that are typically uh, working off of C corporations. So, you know, you don't see that as much, although it could, it could arise. It would then probably result in some definitive ruling on what is it? Is it a, you know, is it a horse? Is it a donkey? Is it a cow? It's a four-legged animal of some sort, but what? So kind of an animal is it right oh yeah i had to figure that out i was working at a company um and i won't say the name of the company but the president was quite good at meeting people and um walking off with a, a check with a large check and i'm not sure i that there always was paper involved but i was tasked to keep the books and it turns out that uh the the you're debiting cash for the check you received from the investor and you have to credit someone and the account that you would credit is called subscribed stock and wow. it's an equity uh classification for the accounting um and it's not a specific class of equity it's equity that has been subscribed but not issued under the gap rules that's the required categorization this was a public company and we were audited and um so I'm pretty sure we did it correctly. And yes, that was the um, classification of this cash receipt it was held in an equity account called subscribed stock. Um, it's not debt. And that's a good thing for the company because it, uh, I mean, it doesn't violate loan covenants. So right. if the company does have outstanding debt, then there probably are some limits on additional debt. And this does not count against that. Right. It doesn't count against it. It doesn't create a priority conflict with other debt. It it doesn't generate uh, more of a worry about, you know, we're now at this level of debt, like, you know, there's some level that people start getting really uncomfortable about the potential for three creditors who would claim a default in like a non-payment of interest kind of thing. And all of a sudden, those three creditors can put the company into bankruptcy, can force that bankruptcy filing. So there's a lot of little ramifications based on whether it's classified one way or the other. Um, at the same time, if it is equity, then you would think there would be some obligation to invite the person to a shareholder meeting, which is typically an annual corporate requirement, although many companies ignore it or or waive it or do it by written consents or do it by Zoom calls. You can do it any number of convenient ways. But if someone is really a holder of equity, they should be invited. And if that's really the categorization. Now, the other thing I was going to say is the other simple aspect for a founder that's very useful is if the founder has himself and the team as the shareholders and there are no other shareholders, and everything else is a safe agreement. So let's say the founders put in a lot of sweat equity and there's four of them or five of them and they own 100% of the, of the stock. And uh, let's pretend there's 10 people that put $100,000 each or a million dollars collectively into these safe agreements. And the safe agreements have no term. They're just waiting for some future financing event to happen. If that financing event doesn't happen and then the founder and his team all say, we've got to sell the business and we've got to get whatever best deal we can get. They don't have to ask the safe holders if they agree. 
because the safe holders don't have voting rights. They're not shareholders. Now, your point is, well, they're more like shareholders than they are like debt holders. But technically, so far from what I've seen, most uh, big law firms, medium law firms, small law firms say, if the shareholders are these five people and they vote to sell the company, uh, basically we can sell the company. And then whatever the formula is inside the safe agreement of a liquidity event, whether it's a sale of assets or sale of stock, whatever it is, that's the calculated formula. So there's no necessary conversion into stock. And that could be like, you know, you basically gave an interest-free loan for a number of years. You may get your principal back if enough money is paid, but you're not necessarily gonna ride the upside advantage unless the formula inside the safe agreement gives you that right in some form. And most times the safe agreement doesn't necessarily give that right. So it does give the founder and the team a fair amount of, of autonomy to say, you know, we've given it our best. The VCs are shutting the valves off. And there are a number of them that are saying this now. There are a number of teams that are literally saying, we've knocked our head against the wall. The VCs are basically holding on to dry powder, figuring they can wait and see how the you know, creative destruction plays out in the market. And then we can invest at a much lower price. So I think that's really the story on what's happening. So you could argue VCs even to some degree like safe agreements signed by other people. Because, <laughs> you know, because in a way it's your point, which is if the business fails and the team has basically learned a lot and so long as they don't use the original assets or if they use the original assets, they buy them in some fair arm's length way and then distribute the proceeds in whatever way the debt instruments and the safe instruments require, the VCs get a team that know a lot more and aren't saddled with having to necessarily carry those earlier investors forward. Although I think your point is, well, maybe that's another area where there could be substantial litigation, right? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, let me ask you two separate questions. First of all, let's say that management and the freewheeling way that modern technology companies seem to operate decides to never to get lazy and never bother issuing shares to anyone. Now, it, is this a hole in the corporate veil? Can the investor now say, well, this it wasn't really a real corporation because they never issued any stock? The original founders um, transferred assets in and have even a spreadsheet entry that says, here's our distribution of ownership as an electronic, the equivalent of a certificate, but an electronic. I mean, you can go online these days and there are tools like Carta, has tools, CARTA, this is not an advertisement for them, but they've automated a lot of this record keeping. There's, I think there's another one that's called, um, is it Square or Swipe or Stripe or something like that, that basically enables almost a non-lawyer to basically generate everything online in a paperless transaction to get a founding of a company going. And that's how much automation already exists. So your point is, but if they never really document that there actually was some bill of sale transfer of intellectual property, business plan, domain name, corporate name, whatever into the business and never a corresponding bookkeeping entry that says that's an exchange for the stock ownership that you're getting, um, is there really a de jure corporation? Is it, yeah, you have a corporation, but it's never really been energized with the board of directors or anything else. Although I think the courts will strain pretty hard to say, if you form the entity and it has a tax ID and you're paying your franchise fee, we'll treat it like there's a corporation here. And it's, it's up to the board to figure out, or maybe the shareholders to, to figure out um, who should participate and at what levels. 
But yeah, there are messes like that that exist for sure. What about the SEC? I don't think the SEC pays a lot of attention to small private companies that aren't raising significant amounts of money. I think they have so many bigger fires to fight in cryptocurrency and other areas, you know, NFTs and other areas where there's a lot of ambiguity. I mean, a small company that gets started with, you know, accredited investors, true accredited investors who are supposed to be sophisticated. They may not be in fact as sophisticated as, as they claim to be, but they have the financial well-being to suffer the uh, outcome. I mean, I've seen crazy situations where a family member will want to do an investment and they'll have their father um, make the investment and the father is not sophisticated, it might be an older person or the mother, uh, because, hey, you know, that's kind of my money and my estate, but I'm the sophisticated guy, but they may actually have the profile financially, but the father may have the profile or the mother may have the profile but they're not really that interested in the investment. So it's kind of a crazy situation where, you know, the son or the daughter want to do the investment and the parent says, I don't know what happened here, but I never got a stock certificate. So I'm, I was happy to like support this, but where's the paperwork? And that happens. And then the son or the daughter say, well, you know, don't blame me, blame the company. And that almost becomes like a disguised option which is, well, maybe there could be a rescission or a refund if there really wasn't an accredited investor behind that investment. You know, if the, you didn't really have all the elements for the accredited investor. You know, sometimes in hindsight, things are always what the person involved wants them to be. I just had a, a potential prospective client who was not a good fit. And um, anyway, this um, potential client uh, had a trust situation and I did some initial consulting and um, then they wanted a bunch more consulting and um, I sent them some questions to help scope the project, which they never answered, um, but they wanted more consulting. So I said, okay, I'll give you more consulting and send them an invoice at my standard rates for um, the additional time that they wanted. And um, then they came back to me saying, um, so much money. Right. Uh, why, why so much money for such a simple situation? Right. And uh, my response was, why so much consulting for such a simple situation? Yeah, that's good. I got to remember that line. But I do think uh, there are a lot of tire kickers. I mean, I hate to say this because it sounds so awful, but the internet has opened up what I would say is a comparative market for people to get what they think is their entitlement to free initial advice. So they'll call like five professionals, maybe an attorney, maybe an accountant, maybe a, a, you know, just go across the board of anyone that says, you know, the initial call is free or 15 minutes, the initial call is free, whatever it says is a way to make it easier for people to get to know who the person is. And they'll spend time with the person and then there's like no follow-up, even though they say, oh, I'm going to follow up because they're really doing kind of a um, beauty contest is another way to say it. They're doing a, let's see who can give me the best deal. They think in a transactional mentality. I mean, even Donald Trump must do this is my guess. He's got so many lawyers in so many different cases. I hate to, bring him into the story, but he just got indicted in Georgia. And, you know, he's got a team of lawyers in Georgia. I don't know where all the money's going to come. The other flash news that came in tonight was that Rudy Giuliani has such horrendous legal bills for himself that he's out of money and he needs to figure out whether he needs to file personal bankruptcy. Now he's got bigger problems because he's in the criminal case in Georgia. He probably will be he has been indicted there as one of the 18 co-conspirators with Trump. And he probably has all sorts of other woes. He's been at least suspended from practicing law in New York. And he was a lawyer for a long time in New York. And he was a federal prosecutor. And he was the mayor of New York City during 9-11. I mean, the guy 
used to be viewed as a leader. And now he's viewed as kind of a clown uh, in a car full of clowns. And it's sad. And I hate to, I hate to say it because I, I thought he did a great job leading New York out of that disaster of 9-11. I think he did probably more leadership than most other leaders during that period, that crazy period of time over 20 years ago. And he should have retired. I mean, after that whole thing got you know resolved, if you say it ever got resolved, New York got back on its feet. Um, he lost the next election or didn't run, I forget. I don't think, I think he lost it. Um, he should just retire. He's gonna go down. If he ends up in jail, it's kind of the worst way to end up doing your retirement in jail. I mean, I can't think of Trump uh, imagining, I can't even imagine Trump walking into a jail cell. I mean, of course, I couldn't imagine Elizabeth Holmes or Sonny Balwani walking into a jail cell either, and they're there. They, they're they taking their medicine. I don't think Trump, I mean, the one utterance he made to the court, not to divert all our discussion, but the one utterance he made is, hey, I'm 77 years old. He pointed that out to the judge as though that was going to give him some mercy on on the charges, but um, it really didn't matter to that uh, D.C. District Court judge. So what does this have to do with safe agreements? Not a lot except to say the notion of a corporation is a shield against liability if the corporation is properly formed and properly operated and legally compliant and individuals cannot get tagged for individual personal liability. So going back to that earlier comment I made about the Vietnamese company that just got tagged for $787 million in that product liability case in the federal courts in Ohio, literally, I think today or yesterday, um, they can close the company, including presumably close it in Vietnam. I don't know if there's a treaty um, um, between the U.S. and Vietnam on enforcement of judgments. There is generally a, a, a general treaty between various countries called the New York Convention that generally allows judgments to be enforced between signatory countries, but some countries haven't signed. So you can't really enforce a judgment in the overseas company country. No. So Maybe... Um, the SEC is not particularly looking at small safe agreements, but having been um, on the sell side of due diligence, um, the buyer will seize upon, in my experience, a buyer might seize upon any flaws in the seller's stock history. And uh, if not killing the um, potential merger outright, um, enact discounts. Um, for each uh, knit that they can find. Um, so uh, for that reason, I think that um, most um, startups would want to uh, follow the book and have an attorney involved, an SEC attorney involved when right. they do their fundraising, even if um, the amounts are below the threshold for unless, SEC. Uh, unless, they really, unless they really have a high degree of trust with those investors. Like if mm -hmm. you really have a high degree of trust with friends, family, like a soup. But even then people like to say, you really should make sure there's documents behind it. 95% of um, cash outs are um, by acquisition, not by going public. Right. And in such an acquisition, the buyer is going to send in a big four um, CPA firm to look for any possible discounts they can find. I've seen, um, uh, Companies that will um, always, no matter how clean the target um, company is, after the acquisition, they will sue. And it's just a strategy to get a discount. Yeah, I mean, I think I heard a statistic today that was interesting, which I've heard many times before. Even the best VC firms throughout California, throughout the United States, they expect over 50% of their private placements into startup companies to fail, totally fail, which means the business is gonna crash and burn, the team is gonna go away, and there's nothing gonna be left, over 50%. They expect about maybe 25% to 35% to kind of 
get to some type of M and A, um, you know, like a first, you know, like a base hit. It's not going to be a home run. It's not going to be a double. Maybe they'll get most. Maybe they'll get some of their money back, their preferred stock money back. Who knows what the common shareholders are going to get? And the other fifteen or so percent is maybe going to get them some multiple. And it's only like five percent that are going to lead to a home run or the grand slam that you sometimes see, like a Google or a Facebook or an Amazon or an Apple computer. I mean, that's a grand slam. That's a mega hit. And that's a very rarefied event. And then the interesting thing that was comparatively stated, which I had never focused on, is if you asked Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, who operate Berkshire Hathaway, of the public companies that they invest in or the big private companies they invest in, which they would say, well, the, you know, we're there 80 years of, of investing, or I think they're in their 90s now, let's call it 70 years of investing. They've invested in like 500 companies. They would say something like seven to 10 of those 500 companies is what made Berkshire Hathaway successful. And like the majority of those private companies just kind of were not that great. They did okay. Um, some of them went out of business for sure, but they weren't like super, super performing uh, entities. So it's it was an interesting comparison because it was a point that says there's a long tail and the long tail is very thin and it's the exceptionally lucky investor that is in the right place at the right time with the right people and the right you know market and the right product or service that just clicks and you have to be extremely lucky including like Bill Gates I mean the final story I'll tell is you know Bill Gates was lucky enough to go to a high school that purchased one of the first uh, mini computers when he was in high school and he got hooked with I think his buddy Paul Allen in high school in high school and if that like one in a million shot that a high school had funds to pay for a mini computer didn't occur in the state of Washington in Bellevue or Redmond or wherever he was living, Seattle at the time, somewhere in the Seattle area, he might not have ever gotten interested in computers because he was a college dropout. I mean, he <laughs> basically got his, his interest in computers in high school, as did Paul Allen. And, and yeah. so it's like a one in a million shot. It's a stroke of luck. And, you know, people talk about him like, you know, he's one of the 10 geniuses in the category of, you know, Einstein, which maybe he is, I'm not, I'm not taking it away, but he was in the right place at the right time with the right circumstances. And that's probably like one in a million. Now he had a lot of brain power for sure. And he does. Um, maybe most recently he's been in the news in a negative way because his wife divorced him. So maybe his brain power is not completely, you know, uh, perfect. But, you know, he's done extremely well. He's a billionaire, uh, as in War as is Warren Buffett, as probably is Charlie Munger. And, you know, they probably look at a lot of this stuff involving safe agreements saying people have to understand that there's a high degree of risk in any startup, a high degree of risk. And it's really far, far more risk than you can ever get your arms around, ever because it's it's most businesses, most startup businesses fail because uh, they run out of money. I mean, there's just not enough money to keep them going. Uber would have failed, but for all the capital that was put into it, Uber made a lot of mistakes, a lot of legal problems. They're still working their way through. They got kicked out of China. They lost billions of dollars in China. So, you know, you gotta have a lot of capital often to get something going. And I think it's it's a fair statement to say, uh, when you sign a safe, don't think or don't assume it's safe because it's not, just because the underlying business is not. And if you're used to getting a, a typical bank return in a safe way, in a truly safe way that presumably the FDIC provides some insurance, then you should understand that's not what a startup company does.
it just isn't. So on the other side of that, for founders who issue safe agreements, they should understand that they're not going to get full dollar for the um, safe agreements they issue um, because of the amount of risk associated with them. That's true. Uh, That's true. You, you want to get full dollar for your uh, in, from your investors, then you need to have a lawyer and you need to have something more formal. So, Steve, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my eye on any reported cases that come up in the safe agreement area. You should keep your eye on any tax cases that come up because I think we're going to see, particularly if this next prediction of a next recession is true, we're going to see a lot of people um, have their expectations dashed and maybe both from a financial point of view, a legal point of view, and a tax point of view, it's going to be like, oh, I had no idea. So that, on, you know, on that note, let me emphasize one thing, that the holding period for tax benefits, either long-term capital gain or qualified small business stock, Section 1202, um, which can include tax-free capital gain, um, that these benefits don't start the timing doesn't, the time clock doesn't start, and the valuation of the company does not get triggered um, until stock is actually issued. Right. So um, if you have a safe agreement with an indefinite uh, delay between having subscribed stock and having actual stock certificates, I realize there may be adverse tax consequences. Right. So Steve, you're, you're a great accountant and great tax professional on this stuff. How do people... How do people reach you when they have a question? My uh, email is srabin, that's S for Steve, Rabin, R-A-B as in Bravo, I-N, at srabin.com. I can also be reached at wwwtaxservice 2 u the number two, the letter U, or and my cell phone, 408-887-6433. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for spending the time on this topic. I think it's a topic that's going to come up again and again. And, you know, at some point, Y Combinator will probably issue some statistics. They should, if you ask me, because they know how these safe agreements, they actually, in their own pool of startups, know what the real numbers are. Now, that would be a very interesting SEC regulation saying if you're an incubator, you got to issue some reports at a high level of so what's really happening in terms of success and failure and that gives um, sort of more knowledge as it were more disclosure knowledge now i'm not saying why combinators doing anything wrong they're not uh, there's lots of other incubators besides Y combinator that are using safe agreements uh, but at some level as more and more of the investing public decides to go with private investments, alternative investments, sometimes even out of their 401ks, sometimes out of their IRAs, sometimes out of their SEP IRAs, sometimes out of their Roth IRAs. We can talk about those subjects uh, uh, separately for self-directed investors. But conceptually, there would be some real knowledge there that the SEC could get some statistics on that up to now it's really been like a black hole and I think those statistics would be helpful so that the investing public knows that there's really a high degree of risk means there really is a high degree of risk. And you just shouldn't assume that you're going to get your capital back or you're going to get even part of your principal back because it may not happen. You're essentially trying to hit a home run uh, with a company that may not have enough capital to even get to first base. And that's always uh, an uncertainty in the market, an uncertainty in the team, an uncertainty in what's happening from a competitive point of view and a huge number of other factors, as we all know. So thanks for spending the time, Steve. Thank you for having me, Jen. You're welcome. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Well. Tune in next time on The Valley Current.